Think New Mexico, the aptly titled think tank based in Santa Fe, has a rather successful legislative record. Their triumph this year was a group of proposed constitutional amendments affecting the Public Regulation Commission. Voters okayed two measures that reorganized the agency, and they also roundly approved new requirements for holding elected office at the PRC. Now, it's up to lawmakers to decide what those qualifications will be. And I'm have producer Matt Grubbs now with Think New Mexico's Fred Nathan. Fred Nathan, we should start off a little bit um, with history of, of Think New Mexico. People hear Think Tank and they think Brookings or American Enterprise, right. someone who's coming at an issue with a very specific um, ideological framework. That's not how you operate. No, it isn't, Matt. Um, we're different than most think tanks. You know, most think tanks, as you say, are either way, way over on the left or way, way over on the right. And we just believe in a state that's 49th or 50th in too many of these national rankings that the focus ought to be on solutions rather than ideology. And consistent with that, we've got a board of Republicans and Democrats. Your viewers may know several of them. Uh, chairman of the board's a former Republican governor, Gary Carruthers. We have a former Democratic Attorney General, Paul Bardicke. And a lot of statesmen and stateswomen mixed in, people like Roberta Ramo, um, former first, uh, first woman president of the American Bar Association, sure. LaDonna Harris from Americans from Indian Opportunity, uh, Edward Lujan, um, Claire Apodaca. I always get in trouble sure. when I start mentioning all these. <laughs> Maybe because you forget. Like yeah, exactly. The one I, I forget is the one who's watching. But. <laughs> exactly. Well, um, and you've also um, really had success. I mean, I think back to um, your work with uh, both Governor Richardson and Speaker Lujan in sort of shifting the food tax or, or getting rid of the food tax, mm -hmm. I should say, and, and kind of shifting that burden elsewhere. Right. Um, is that because you're working sort of both sides of the aisle and you can get in all the doors you need to? Yeah, I think, I think the problem is if, if you're just coming from one side, there's a very small margin of error. And I, I think you're right, Matt, that it does help that we're working with both sides. And frankly, we think it just makes better policy uh, when you're talking to everyone and, and have every, everybody at the table. Well, let's get down to, uh, to business here with the PRC. That was sure. your big thrust in the, in the last session. Um, and uh, the, of course, sort of the, the flagship amendment was amendment number two, which is passed wildly with like 80 or 81 percent of the vote, right. um, didn't list the exact qualifications that, that public regulation commissioners should have. Um, why, I guess, why weren't those qualifications in that amendment? That's a great question, and the, the honest answer is politics. You have to get, to get a constitutional amendment on the ballot. Uh, you have to go through the legislature, and we were struggling, frankly, to get it on the ballot. So we thought the best way to do it would be first to see if we could pass it and to say the legislature is authorized to change the qualifications. And now that it's been on the ballot, and as you point out, so many New Mexicans supported it, uh, over 535,000, the most in the century history of the state. So we think we've got a pretty good mandate to go back to the legislature and say, the people really do want us to increase these qualifications. Um, and your viewers may not be aware of the qualifications right now are just that you're 18 years, at least 18 years of age, lived in the state at least one year, and you're that's not a convicted felon. felon. Yeah, exactly. And that's it. You know, no, no educational qualification, no college degree, no high school degree, not even elementary degree. And this is for a job that's very technical. Uh, you have to understand things about economics and engineering and law, so there really should be some qualifications, and I think the voters figured that out. I think oftentimes the PRC, um, their job, even though it's, it's much broader in scope, and we'll get to that in a little bit, but it's compared to a utility commissioner. Um, and uh, you, know, you look at those nationwide, and, and the vast, vast majority of them are either from that field or they have uh, at least a bachelor's degree, that sort of thing. That's uh, right. Then not the case, though, with, with the people who've been elected to the PRC? No, it's been about 50-50 with a bachelor's degree. Um, but, you know, uh, n now we're in the position of going to the legislature, and a lot of people think that, that that's all that we're seeking. Um, really what we'd like to see is a balance, just as you would in the private sector if you were hiring somebody that was going to make decisions affecting hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and millions of dollars because, of course, they're making rate decisions on electricity and gas and landline telephones. And there, I think you would expect some balance of educational requirements and job qualifications. And we're not going to make it, you know, I, I always joke my wife has a master's degree from Yale in fine arts, but I wouldn't want her anywhere near setting utility rates. Sure. But, 
But uh, so we're not looking strictly for educational qualifications. And frankly, there could be some people that don't have a college degree. Of course, Steve Jobs, you think of, uh, Bill Gates, Harry Teague in this state, um, people that have run major businesses without a college degree. So I don't think we're going to make that the, the yardstick, but we are going to look for, you know, perhaps the more education uh, education you have, the less you need in terms of job requirements, okay. and vice versa. If you've got a lot of job skills and background uh, and super, you know, supervising people like economists and lawyers and engineers, maybe you don't need quite as much educational background. Okay, and in fact, as you referenced, we heard a little bit of that in uh, in the debate on the on the floor. You know, when people were talking about getting this passed, you know, I, I remember hearing someone say, "Well, yeah, a bachelor's is not a a panacea. I mean, you can know a lot about one thing and nothing about." That's exactly right. All that other stuff. We agree. Um, so how, I guess, how do you approach it? Where do, where do you begin? Do you, do you have the people um, lined up to support bills, and, and, and where do we start? Do you have, have that information yet? We do. We're, st we're still working on some of it in terms of sharing the legislation with stakeholders to see where that common ground is. Um, and then we've got two other constitutional amendments. And, and if there's time, we've got another two additional bills to reform the PRC, but we're, we're talking to the same sponsors we had getting these bills okay. on to the people like Tom Taylor. Um, Ken Martinez carried uh, one of the bills last time, and we'll be going back to the same legislators. Joseph Cervantes, who was in the House, right. now, is, now a state senator. So it'll be the same, probably, cast of, of supporters. Sure, sure. Um, the other two amendments come from, um, stem from the fact that the PRC has so much to do. Um, and, you know, we look at uh, the corporate registrations and um, the depart, well, what you had hoped would be the Department of Insurance. It's, a, it's an independent superintendent of insurance now, Correct. right? Yes. Um, just explain those two passed much more narrowly because it, it seems, and we're just Monday morning quarterbacking the election, but it really seems like they were um, very complex issues. Something like corruption or qualifications, it's pretty easy for someone to grasp and right. say. Either you're for it or you're against right, it. Right, exactly. And those were hard to explain in a constitutional amendment format. But the, the, the goal with both of them, as you said earlier, was to pare back and streamline the PRC and get them pared back to their core mission, which it should be utility rate regulation. And so those are two areas where they have never really worked well at the Public Regulation Commission and maybe just taking them in order. Uh, corporate registration should be very ministerial. Uh, this is something that LLCs, limited liability corporations, have to file with the PRC and say who's on their board and who's their agent for service of process. And what should be a simple process has really been plagued by uh, losing checks, losing paperwork, uh, what should be an, you know, a simple filing sometimes takes d days, weeks, months. And meanwhile, you have the same thing going on at the Secretary of State's office for LLPs and other business filings. And when we looked around the country, what we found was that 41 states just consolidate this at the Secretary of State's office and have an efficient one-stop shop for businesses. So that's all this amendment was trying to do. But as you can see, it's a lot to explain. Sure. And uh, so that's why I think it struggled on the ballot, but why I think it will be a very important and good reform for, especially for businesses and, and for consumers. And, and then you look at um, handling insurance, and that seems in and of itself as big a task as handling utilities. It is. Um, and, and also under the PRC's purview. Correct, and the, and the problem there, and we, we just think it would be addition by subtraction, is twofold. Number one is we've had, um, in the 16 years that the Department of Insurance has been at the PRC, uh, a lot of superintendents cycling through either resigning or being fired. Um, two years ago, we had five superintendents in a four-month period. And we believe, I know, we believe that's because you've got one superintendent reporting to five bosses with competing political agendas, which creates some inherent conflicts very destabilizing for the agency to go through that many leaders. And then at the rank and file level, uh, the PRC has been put on probation by the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, their accrediting agencies, three times in those 16 years, always for the same thing, which is that they don't have enough qualified staff. And that was because past PRC commissioners 
were candidly putting their political friends and cronies in positions that the, where you needed professionals like economists, lawyers, actuaries, uh, those kinds of people. So again, in both those instances, the Department of Insurance would be better off without having that oversight from the PRC and being somewhat more autonomous. Okay, and so the way it stands now, or, or how it'll be reorganized, um, there will be a, a committee that appoints the superintendent? Th that's exactly right. Most states, th there's two different models, neither one of which work very well. One is with the governor appointing the superintendent of insurance. The other is with an elected superintendent. And we did a lot of research and found um, corruption in both processes. You know, some, some governors, um, you know, it becomes a bidding war to find out who becomes the superintendent of insurance. Sure. Um, and the, the, the um, insurance commissioners that run, I think that's 13 states, and we found evidence of corruption in six of those states. In Louisiana, every superintendent of insurance has wound up in jail. So we didn't think that was a great system. So this system, we believe, can work ba based on actually my own experience. When they went through that cycle of five superintendents in a four-month period, on the last election, what they decided to do is have the PRC members each appoint two people to a committee. So we had 10 people, and I was fortunate to be one of those 10. And they were from every part of the state, Democrat, Republican, uh, from the industry, from the consumer standpoint. And I thought it was going to be a Donnybrook. But it actually worked extremely well. We had 25 applicants. We were all able to agree on the 10 that we wanted to interview. And then we came up with the, fi the final five that were sent on to the PRC without any struggle at all, because we all wanted the same thing. We wanted a qualified superintendent of insurance. And that's what Constitutional Amendment 4 will produce is a committee like that. And now we have to work out the details, which is who gets on the committee, who appoints the committee, and that sort of thing. And um, I think we can come up with something that will work. Okay, so four has a little bit more work to do, two has a little bit more work to do, three is just kind of... Well, three is <laughs> a little complicated because you're, you're taking a, a division out of an agency, and so there'd be a little bit of struggle with the FDEs, the employees, and, okay. the, and the money, and how that gets transferred, but you're right. Over to the I, Secretary of State's office right. from, the, from the PRC. But that ought to be worked out. I think that'll work. Okay. We've got a few minutes left um, here. L let's go um, to the fire marshal. Um, the, what was it? Was it ambulance regulation? I yes. mean, they regulate everything. Your taxi rates. A lot of people don't yeah. realize that. Ski lifts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Pipelines. Um, railroad crossings. Okay. <laughs> um, so we want to really pare back, as we said earlier, the PRC to its core mission, which is utility rate regulation. So we're going to uh, try to have a bill that will take all those other functions away from them and put them, park them at agencies where they might make a better fit. For example, the state fire, fire marshal would probably make more sense at the Department of Homeland Security uh, where you've got emergency management and okay. there'd be some synergies there. Okay. There really aren't any synergies at the PRC. And then the final bill that, that we have has to do with transportation, which is often overlooked. Um, and they have enormous power there. They have a 1930s law under which they decide market entry and pricing for every type of uh, transportation from taxis to limousines, buses, moving lines, wreckers, uh, you name it. And that process really hasn't worked very well. It goes back to the days when they were at the State Corporation Commission. Okay. Back then they were regulating the railroads. And when cars and trucks were invented, the railroad said, well, what about them? They, shouldn't they get the same treatment that we've been getting and be regulated? And of course, the state took that on. And this happened in other states as well. And then in 1980, at the federal level, you had deregulation of um, airline and trucking under President Carter, which was a huge bone both to businesses and consumers and has generally been a success. And the Fed said at that point to the states, you still have authority over intra as opposed okay. to interstate okay. transportation, and you can decide whether you want to do the same thing. Most states did. New Mexico has kept that power. So right now, if you wanted to start a taxicab company in Santa Fe where there's just one company, you would have to file for what's called the Certificate of Convenience and Necessity, which costs about ten dollars or $15,000 to hire the lawyer and to do the wow. paperwork. And then the PRC decides. And we think that that might be better left to the marketplace. And what we find in the taxicab industry is that we have stifled job formation, 
business formation, price competition, and what we have are in many communities just one company um, with a monopoly, and in other communities no taxicab service at all um, because they can't get over that barrier to entry of, of hiring a lawyer for that amount of money. In Santa Fe, there was a green entrepreneur that wanted to come in and start a green taxicab company, and he had no idea what he had to go through. And under this law, you have to notify your, your competitor who filed a 200-page legal brief, <laughs> not including affidavits. Sure. And, 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 uh, and he finally threw in the towel. Of course. And that would have been a, probably a good business and some jobs that the state could certainly use. Well, Fred, we thank you for coming in and, and most especially for taking a look at something so complex like the PRC and being willing to pull at some of those threads and see where they lead. Well, Matt, thank you again for having me. Of course.